This is a Studio 11 special report. Talk to us Tuesdays will not be seen this week so that we may bring you this special program. Oh. <laughs> This special program right here. Uh, hey, what's up? It's Jay. Uh, normally, it's uh, Talk to Us Tuesday, because that's what we do. Today, we have a special treat for you. Uh, last week after Breakfast Club, we had a wonderful opportunity to sit down with our good friend Misha Mansour. Misha Mansour is a guitar player. He's a guitarist. He's a musician. Um, he started the band Periphery. And, um, and he's a good friend of ours. He comes up to Breakfast Club a lot. He's got some very cool cars, Lamborghini, Porsche, all sorts of stuff. We're going to talk about it um, here in the Late Night Playset. So this interview was done last week after Breakfast Club, last Friday. And uh, in place of Talk to Me Tuesday, Talk to Us Tuesday with the missus, we are going to uh, spend this time with you instead. So uh, fear not, we will be back next Tuesday for Talk to Us Tuesday. <laughs> Yes, that's right. It's a lot. Uh, and in the meantime, enjoy Misha Mansour on Late Night Playset. Tonight's episode of Late Night Playset is brought to you by St. Clair Insurance. They say all that separates men and boys is the coverage for their toys. St. Clair Insurance has coverage for your toys. Coverage for your toys.com. So with that, we are back sitting here with, is it Misha Mansour? Yep. Is that as simple as, and you're, I know you're from the band Periphery, but I know you as a guy who, whenever you're in town, you come up to Breakfast Club, Yep. and I am grateful to see you. You always bring cool cars. You always bring a good attitude. Um, we became friends pretty quickly. We have a lot of mutual friends. Yeah, yeah, we do. Um, and just the vibe is very cool with you, and I'm grateful you're here. Thank you for being here. Misha Mansour. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me. And yeah, I just, I just know you as, uh, as Jay with the yellow Porsche, which, which, you know, that's the thing is like you go to these car things and like I almost know people's cars more than I know their, their names. Oh yeah. Um, that's, pull that's, that towards you a little. Bit. Oh sorry. sorry. No, you stay wherever you want. Just pull that towards it. There you go. There we go. Should I just angle it like that? Yeah. Get some. Uh, you're Mr. Gear guy. What are you talking about? A, well, I didn't know well, if I it was like omnidirectional or or cardioid, right? Do, uh, well, there we go. Do you do you sing too? I know you. I do. Guitar. I do. I don't. As though I have okay. no vocal talent whatsoever. So what I do. You, what's your instrument? So I I play guitar. Okay. Um, I actually started on drums, um, but oh. I wasn't good enough to play drums in my band. <laughs> in your band. In my band. Yeah. Like uh, I actually started uh, because. It was kind of around the time where you could start recording on on, on a computer, you know? Uh, it was like home studio. Yeah, yeah. Like this was like, well, say like two thousand, right? And uh, I had a gaming computer, and it had like an audio input on it, so I could plug my guitar into it. And there were just it was like like this, a quarter inch jack. Kind yeah, of? exactly. Oh, wow, that's huge. Yeah, for a and computer. and yeah, it was. I I like opted for the upgraded sound cards, this custom computer that I put together, right? Of course. And um, it it. It was like right around this time where there was software being developed, and very importantly, like there's this company, this very small company. They're they're huge now, but um, <laughs> they're called TuneTrack, and they they made program drums, like realistic program. They actually sounded. The whole goal was to sound like like maybe if you didn't know it was program, you'd think it was real drums. And I was like, man, that's a, you know, because if you know anything about recording drums, that's probably the biggest expense on a recording when it comes to like a rock or metal record or whatever so like that was a huge thing and i didn't have to rely on a drummer studio time i could just record in my bedroom by myself there, there were uh, amp modelers there was like a you know the line six pod if you're familiar with that like all this stuff to where i could just be in my room making an entire song you know arranging it writing uh playing guitar <laughs> like for for bass at that time i didn't own a bass so i'd just record a clean guitar and like pitch shift it down an octave oh yeah you know i love that it's, it's super like ghetto day for night for uh, the movie business <laughs> i love that so so but but like once i discovered that i could do that i just didn't leave my room oh and yeah I was, I was actually, down the rabbit hole yeah and i was going to to university just because that's what you do you know i'm from i'm from bethesda maryland Oh, and, and do we ever talk about that? I My grandparents we were in Maryland, so yeah, I was down there all the time. And and that that area, it's like if you don't go to 
college university you're homeless you're like, oh, that's, yeah. and i firmly no, go, i firmly a... believe that and like you know that's that school i went to was like part of a very good school system uh my parents valued education over everything you know they went basically broke just trying to get us into this school system because oh, awesome. you know it was a good system and uh, uh shout out to your parents yeah shout that's out to my parents awesome and like like we we were quite house poor they live like we we uh, had a house that they could not afford because they wanted to be in the zip code that allowed you to go to this public school that was really good her parents uh, did something like that too yeah i, I mean yeah shout out to all it's, those parents. when you're a kid you don't appreciate you don't have the gravity gratitude for the gravity of that type well of and also your school is just what all schools schools are like obviously and now in hindsight i'm like no that was a very nice yeah you don't know <laughs> like time, i had an yeah. electronic music class <laughs> like you know like there was wow so you had you so you're so that yeah all right so this is the same thing as the other story i was telling you you kind of always had a trajectory um it's, it's it's hard to say because actually like this was all born of like i was going to to university i was there for, for two years not knowing what i want and of course they're like like oh that's fine you can figure it out it's like yeah we'll take your semesters of, of tuition <laughs> oh, while yeah. you figure out yeah. that's fine <laughs> relax buddy do, do seven years and become a philosophy major you know <laughs> like so so i had no idea what i wanted to do but for the first the way i put it is like for the first time in your life you're told oh you could do whatever you want like every moment before that you have to go to school it's the law mm -hmm. it is literally illegal not to go to school and then one day it's all different and yeah. You're expected to understand Currency this. Currency isn't relevant to you. <laughs> and 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 I really wish, I really wish that someone had told me, and that more people were encouraged to just take a year and work, just work oh. any job, any right? like the, the shittier the better. You know? Do you mean to learn the grind? Just to understand that that's an option and what that's like, because oh, then you have then you have the alternative, and you understand like this is sort of like this is a job that's available to unskilled labor and maybe there's a career that there are careers that you can I, i'm not saying that in any sort of negative way because sure. there are potential careers that you could go you could eventually become a manager or whatever district manager you can make good money sure. but you understand that that's an option for me and and the way i grew up like i thought that that was the path and i'm not joking to homelessness mm -hmm. and and that was something i was very afraid of was be, becoming like homeless and poor and, and whatever your parents ingrained that in you um, I, th I, from, I, I don't think it, it came from them, but it also didn't get sort of like dissuaded by them. Yeah, they didn't it, wash it or, out either. <laughs> or the culture, you know, it was, we lived in a, in a neighborhood of much richer people and like there were very rich people that went to, to my school. That at, was, that was me too. This is your elementary school and grade school, elementary high school, school high school, especially. Yeah. Um, you know, and like uh, I'm I'm Jewish, and like I, I had my bar mitzvah. I got a little bit of money for that, but like the stuff that some of the people in my school got for their bar mitzvahs, like cars, multiple cars, like oh my like gosh, just yeah, tens of thousands of dollars. You know, like as a 13 year old, <laughs> you know, like it, it's wild, right? <laughs> yeah, um, you lose all scale at that point. Yeah, and like I knew people who were they turned 16, like got one or two cars from their parents and my, i was like can i get a car they're like yeah go work <laughs> right you can have anything you want <laughs> get whatever car you want help go, yourself go work for welcome it. to go life get a job and i was like well i guess i'm not gonna have a car <laughs> uh, but but yeah i went to i went to i went to university because i thought that was the logical next step mm -hmm. and that's what you're supposed to do right like when i asked my dad like why do I have to go to school today? Oh, so that you could go to middle school, so you could go to high school, so you could get to college, so you could get a good job, get a house, have a family, et cetera, et cetera. There was, that was always a ladder. If I was six years old and asking that question, that was the answer. Mm -hmm. you know. Um, so I firmly believe that. So then all of a sudden, for the first time, I'm in a place I don't have to be, and I'm like, I don't care about any of this stuff. And this all loops back to what I was saying, where I was just stuck in my room recording, and mm -hmm. eventually I was like, maybe I need to take a damn hint. Now, my dad is very much a success story from like, you know, you work hard, you, you study well in school, you get good grades, you go to a good university, you know, and, and get a good job and whatever. And then you'll yeah. find success. So telling that guy, right like, by the book, pretty much, right? very much. Yeah. Right. And of that generation, it is extremely by the book, right? Like boomer generation or whatever you want to call it. Right. Yeah. So, so, and you saw a lot of success, success, not only doing that, but then buying the house and watching that appreciate in value and having kids, et cetera, et cetera. And like trying to tell, my parents like, hey, like I hate school and I don't know what I want to do with my life, and I'm just, and I'm just in my room recording music all day, and I think I need to do that, you know, like that was a, that was a tough conversation, and they were not, it's probably the last thing they wanted to hear, but I also talked to a lot of people who had degrees, they had like masters in English, and I was like, 
why are you working as a as a server at a restaurant yeah. they're like because it's hard to find a job they're like i want to be a journalist i'm like so you have a master's they're like that doesn't mean anything they're like do you know how competitive it is i wish people had told me to network you mm -hmm. know i was like wow and i was like so do you have like school debt they're like yeah that's why I work here. Yeah. And I was just like, that like kind of blew my mind. I was like, okay, so this is the person who followed their dream. They want it more than anything in the world. They followed all the rules. This is what we were told to do. Right. They went through. They went through it all. They did the path, right? And it's not working out. And then I found like, that this is not an isolated incident. I'm <laughs> talking to more and more people. Doing like, the research out on the street. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like I'm talking to all sorts of people who followed the path you're supposed to follow that, that everyone sold you. And it's not working out. These things only make sense. Like going to school and spending all that money only makes sense because the idea is you're going to get a job that then pays for it to where you yeah, barely you even pay notice. Off the debt and exactly. Right. Like yeah. you'll get a good job. Like whatever. Who cares? You got masters. You got PhD. Sure, I'm sure you could get a job. Right. Right. Well, that wasn't the case. And I told my Two, dad, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in debt or whatever it happens to be isn't a big deal when you're a doctor making a half million a exactly. year. Exactly. But when you can't get that doctor job and you're flipping hamburgers at Shake Shack, that's a problem. It doesn't. The math doesn't work out, and it never never fixes itself. And and that's why I actually didn't go to music school either. I know I, I have a lot of friends who went to uh, Berkeley uh, School of Music, mm -hmm. which is extremely expensive. Yeah. And then these guys like get a degree, and they can work at Guitar Center. <laughs> you know, and I, and I mean, and it's like, and they will. No, be... they get the discount though, so that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> so it all works out. <laughs> it yeah. all works out. <laughs> It would all work out if they didn't walk away with like a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars worth of debt because it's a very expensive yeah. school, you know. And yeah. like it, it's so that path didn't make sense. And I was like, look, like I want to just drop out and focus on music because at least that's what I I give a shit about. Yeah. And it's like, let's say I go into political science or philosophy, like. They're interesting subjects, but there's a guy who lives and breathes that. I'm against that guy. Why am I going to win against the guy who just want? That's what he's always wanted, you know. Also, why would you want to even go against that guy? Right. I want that guy to win. To yeah, 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 that. exactly. And it's like, shouldn't I be doing the thing that I feel that passionate about? I was yeah. like, you know, if you could give me a guarantee that I'd go through with like law school or whatever, and like I'd get that job, that's one thing. Guaranteed but now, placement. But now there's no guarantee, and you have the debt and everything. I'm like, well, if the odds are against me, and no matter what I do, shouldn't I be doing the thing that that I'm actually passionate about? The thing where I feel like I'm the guy. I'm yeah. the guy who actually has a shot. Um, and and that's that's how I won my dad over on that that conversation. It's but, not even an argument if you go that route because there is no argument for follow your heart. <laughs> well, the argument was like we want to make sure you're not being lazy. So oh, you don't me so lazy. well. I mean, back then I definitely was. <laughs> really? Well, well oh, I was really kid? bad at school. I was really bad. At anything I didn't care about, like I would just do the bare minimum. Well, that's me too. That's not lazy. It's almost rebellion. Yeah, or because wouldn't you? I don't imagine if you would apply yourself to those other things, you weren't. Lazy. Of course, of course not. But you know, you don't know these things. It just sort of you get Did graded. Did they tell you you were lazy? Like people, uh, the yeah, school yeah, stuff? yeah. Of course, and like the yeah, grades me. speak. For, you know, this is the thing where, where where grades are almost dismissive in a way because they they sort of just cut straight to like no you gotta you gotta see you got a d well obviously you're not applying yourself. you can say whatever you want but this paper says otherwise this paper says yeah. otherwise you know and they're like oh you know you're intelligent but if you it's like i just don't care about any of this stuff you're you such know? potential you're wasting your potential oh well, there we go were you my teacher you know no, like, I, we may have had the same parents <laughs> yeah we did so 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 it was that whole thing so they, what they said was like okay here's the deal we'll we'll let you come home but you're gonna pay rent you're gonna get a full-time job We'll give you a very fair rent for Bethesda, Maryland, which is a relatively expensive area. This is you leaving university yep. to come home. Yeah, okay. they're, they're like, we will allow you to rent a room from us at home. You know, I, I think it ended up being like four or five hundred dollars a month. They're like, that's very fair for Bethesda, Maryland. <laughs> and they're like, you know, you can get a job. Uh, as long as you get a full time job, we don't care what it is, but we will continue to rent you a place. But mm -hmm. you have to maintain it can't be part time. It has to be full time. In your free time, you can do whatever you want. And if that's music, then it's music. And that was the deal. Sounds like a fair. It's, Sounds very that fair. Was, that was deal. extremely yeah. fair. And that was, I was, ex I was so depressed in such a dark place. At university. At university for those two years. Just like it all just kind of, kind of came crashing down because it was like, yeah, it's like I'm on my own and I'm trying to figure out what I want to do and nothing makes sense. And it's just, I see no, no path, no, no future. And I guess I'm a bit of a dreamer. So like when you have like everything being crushed and there's no path forward that I'm excited about, it was, it was just destroying me. 
So actually going home and getting a full-time job and working on music was the happiest I'd been in a long time. You're Loved also, it. You're also Loved on it. something new, some new path. It's not that stuck feeling, right? Yeah, and I worked at uh, a Radio Shack, and it was a, I could walk there from my parents' place, so I didn't need a car, so my expenses were extremely low. Brilliant. So I just walked to work, and, uh, <laughs> and, and it was on commission. And I love that Whoa. because if, if you just get good at sales and if you learn your products and whatever, uh, you don't have to work as many hours to make it. So I was making as much as I would have uh, working a normal job doing, you know, 40 hours a week, doing six hours a day, Whoa. four days a week. Wow. You know, and, and, uh, and that left me with more time for music. And, and I enjoyed sales a lot, you know. I mean, hmm. sometimes it's frustrating because, you know, you, you don't have the certainty. Of, of a paycheck, you know, but, uh, but I enjoyed the dynamic of it. I, I really did enjoy it. And I learned some of the basics from that manager who was a really good manager. Um, so that was a good time. That was, and that was me just following my dream. I remember thinking like, you know, even the radio shack job, those all in the tech, you're always in kind of gadgetry. Yeah. But I love that kind of stuff, you I, know? Yes, yes yeah. I do. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 uh, I, I don't know that stuff sticks. And like, well, I found like with sales, for example, one of the most important things I learned, it wasn't about selling people stuff they don't want. It was more that like, especially with tech, this is very true. It's more like you probably have a problem you're trying to solve and you don't realize that this can actually solve that problem. It's going to make your so life I, better. All I'm doing is educating you about a thing that exists, you know? And it would always start with conversations. It's like, oh, you know, we made money selling cell phones, right? Like that's where you made the real oh, money. Oh, right? so yeah. This is that generation. Yeah. For me, that was, generation. When I was a kid, it was Tandy computers and that little Robbie right. the robot thing. For us, it was cell phones. And if you could get a, accessories on there. And yeah. what I loved about it was that you could, like, uh, they could return the accessories. I'm like, well, th now I can sell every accessory. And I'll be like, yeah, get the 30% oh, off. Like it. Get the 30% off. And if you hate it, return it. But if you keep it, you got 30% off. I'm like, that's easy. <laughs> you get your commission. So I would sell the crap out of accessories, too. <laughs> so um, good. So and, good. Uh, and it was always fun. I always really liked selling the, the, the cell phones and, and stuff like that because. Because, because of a return policy, if you sold someone something they, they didn't want or need, it would come right back and you'd lose your sale. This is a lesson I learned the hard way. So the trick is not to sell people things they don't want, but genuinely find a product that they're like, actually, I think this is going to solve that problem. Like, tell me, you know, tell me what the situation is. What don't you like? Oh, well, guess what? This phone, blah, 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 blah. Mm. Oh, that's kind of interesting. Yeah. And actually, it's only this much. And if you yeah. get the accessories, you'll save a bunch today. So... And I'll they get didn't this. know that before, so they're actually grateful to you for giving them that information. And the only way to know this is by knowing your inventory inside and out, which I, I'm good with specs. I like specs. I mean, you're, you're a car guy. We could probably recite specs all day long, you know? <laughs> it's just that part of our brain that, that, you know, so, like, that actually worked really well. And, like, I found that the people who knew the stuff would sell well, and the people who didn't know so much wouldn't sell as much, you know? Mm. So uh, so that was that was a job I really enjoyed, to be, to, to be honest Isn't with you. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. So, um, but, and you were able to make enough money to get to uh, something where you weren't renting your parents. Uh, I mean, uh, that, 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 took, that took a little while. I was quite content. I, I remember thinking, like, you know, honestly, like, I don't hate my job. And in my free time, you know, I'd kind of sworn off having a girlfriend or anything like that I was like hyper focused. I'm like, I'm going to do music, going to start my band. You know, that's all I did. I didn't go out. I didn't like spend any money on alcohol or drinking or going out. I just, just focus, focus, focus writing. And it didn't feel like work because it was like, I'm exploring this thing now, you can record on computers at home now. Like, that you couldn't do before. And it's like, I'm just opening Pandora's box and like just seeing what's, what's in there, you know? And it was, it was so fascinating. And I was just constantly testing myself, like, how good can I get this to sound? What can I do compositionally? Like, and yeah. I could take as much time. If I wanted to work till four in the morning, I'm not bothering anyone else. I can do it on headphones, yep. you know? Um, so, so it was really, it was just a really like empowering feeling. And it was, it was a cool thing to explore. And I remember thinking like, man, like, if I just work at, at Radio Shack, and, and this is probably be, being naive and being in my 20s, but I was like, if I could just work at Radio Shack and work on music in my free time, like, that's great. Yeah. You know, like, I'm happy. If I ever <laughs> I don't even a, need to make it. <laughs> yeah. I was like, well, I, no, I was like, you know, because there's the talk about making it. My dad was like, all right, well, you need to, you know, you just need to know when to, what, where when to it, cut it off. Yeah, what yeah, what yeah, call yeah. quits, you know, yeah. like, when to cut your losses and just, you know. And I was like, well, you know, if ever I was able to get a band together and, like, we could just get in a van and tour and just play some shows. I don't even care if we make money, but just go play in some other cities for like a crowd. Like that's the dream. Mm -hmm. If I make it that far, a little mini tour. Yeah. And that's all I get out of this. Like that experience. I'm good. Cause I told my dad, I was like, look, like my, my dad, my dad's 
my dad's an economist. He's a numbers guy, and he's just like statistically, you're not gonna you're not gonna see anything from this. Yeah. Like, there's no way, and the odds are stacked against you. So it's you have so to competitive. You there's have so many to other understand people. this. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, but if I don't try. I would not be able to live with myself. I was like, I'd rather like try, fail, and give up, and be like, okay, well, I gave it a fair shot, and 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 that's good enough, you know. Like at least I know it didn't work out after trying it, you know. But he if had, I he had to cave again, because yeah. again, you can't fight that. You argument. can't, you can't. He just wanted what he wanted to make sure was that I wasn't going to get stuck in a sort of loop or rut or something where like, you know, I was uh, I was falling victim to uh, sunk costs or something like that. It's like, oh. oh, I put five years into this. I have nothing to show for it. So maybe one more year, even though I'm miserable. Well, which is if fair. you're playing casino rules, you're right, because that never works right. out. But right. there's also the thing of, I mean, business, investing, anything. I mean, if you do anything long enough, it will pay off. Right. <laughs> well, and So there is that, too. To me, it was just like... It's very simple. It's like either I'm going to be having fun doing this or I'm not, you know? And yeah. if, if it gets to the point where it's like, okay, this is just not worth time, effort, and trouble, then that would be a different thing. Yeah. But uh, – can, can we zoom in a little bit on the music? What the hell was it about music? I mentioned to you before – actually today. But, but we should tell everybody else. We'll let you in. Pull the curtain back a little bit. This is a post-Breakfast Club show. This is a special show. It's a bonus show. <laughs> bonus show. We didn't even introduce it or anything because I figure we'll, we'll put it into something else. But maybe we won't. Maybe you'll just get it like this raw. Um, at Breakfast Club today, somehow it finally came up that I used to be a drummer. And yeah. I used to be pretty good. I used to, When I was a kid, I was really good. I would do sessions in New York City. I was oh, on the radio and stuff okay, like that. Okay, you are really good, yeah. No, I was really good. <laughs> and I stopped playing. I moved out here. I got into TV. You know, whatever. Life happens. Um, uh, but music has always been incredibly important to me. It is to this day. Um, what was it for you? Why is music important to you? What part of music is important to you? Because it seems like the technical side is where you're, where you're stimulated. But yeah. I've also listened to like I told you I found you on Twitch, and I just <laughs> the one where you're like, ah, hey, you guys shouldn't even be hearing this, but ah, whatever. <laughs> I've played that. It's only like a minute clip. I've played it like five times because I was like, I like what's going on here. I like. Okay, I don't even know cool. if it's So I, you're not just a tech guy. You can definitely find the groove of the music. Where is it for you? Tell me anything you want to about why music's yeah. important and how you got into it. Well, like my relationship with music is very weird. Um, I think I have a very strong ear, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know music theory or anything like that. I learned that when I was younger and it all went in one ear and went out the other because I hated it. <laughs> you know? Me too, but you might have retained it because I did the same thing. Music theory, music appreciation, I went through both and I thought I purged it all. But the truth is it did come up a lot. In so for me, I can't read. Like I can't read, and I don't know uh, outside of like basic scales and like all this kind of stuff. Did like, you teach yourself? No, no, no. I took I took like solfege and all that. Like when I was younger. So when I but was you like, can't read. No, I, I, I used I to be able. I used to be able to. I used to, and I just forgot it because I hated. it. So here's what happened: <laughs> when I was like four or something, we went to a friend's place, and I, I figured out how to play "Twinkle Twinkle Little Star" on like someone's piano. I don't remember this. This is mm -hmm. what my mom told me. So she's like, oh. This is the demonstrating same. musical aptitude. Let's give him piano lessons. This is the same story, yeah. So then, <laughs> so I did p piano lessons, which I hated. Nothing worse than piano lessons. Hated, hated, hated. And um, we weren't really also, allowed they to... Also, if you're meant to play the piano, they don't do dick for you. <laughs> <laughs> because I can play any song I've ever heard really well. Oh, really? And I can't read a lick of music, never could. Yeah, so you're, you're, you're an ear guy as well. And like I always got in trouble for that because they're like, read, you're listening, you're not reading. I'd always watch the demonstration and <laughs> yeah, recreate me too. it. And they're like, you're not reading it. And I'm like, oh, I hate reading. And... Um, uh, I'm amazed at people who can read, sight reading. Yeah, yeah. Sight it, reading me, is like the most incredible. I wish I could do it. And every time I've tried to learn, I just start cheating with my ear. It's just yeah. very hard for me to, to, to learn. So like, like I, 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 I had the lessons and I'd have to practice 30 minutes or whatever. And the deal was like, we weren't allowed to watch TV when I was growing up. So like, it's oh. like, if you practice for 30 minutes, you can watch 30 minutes of TV. And it, so it was always this transactional thing, which made mm. me hate it even more. Um, and you know, the irony is like, as I was getting to like nine or 10 years old, I was actually getting like kind of good at, at piano and like learning some classic, but it was always classical stuff. And I wanted to learn contemporary stuff <laughs> and there was just, they were just like, no, you have to learn the classical stuff. And that's what there's the sheet music and whatever. Truly. Once you can play the practical, the, the classical stuff, you can play almost anything. Yeah, the of course. But as a kid, I'm like, I don't care about I've, any of this. I've heard Pac about canon part. way too many times. Yeah. And I was just like, you know, but it's like what my mom liked and. I'm the oldest. I have, I have a brother and a sister. 
I'm the oldest, so I didn't have like an older sibling or anything or an older no, friend to show me really music. No, they were really hard on you too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they were really <laughs> drilling the rules into yeah, you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, my brother had it easy. So uh, 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 <laughs> that's where my parents were like, they apologized. I'm like, we were we were hard on you. And then they were just thinking, <laughs> my brother, everything. He's they didn't even know it till the other ones, oh, right? Oh, of course, of yeah, course, yeah, of, of course. course. He was spoiled rotten. He had, he had playstations and computers and tv like all the tv like just keep him occupied just whatever you want still working on mission over here he was he was basically (laughs) the apology that i never got (laughs) but but i but but you know i showed him cool music like i didn't have anyone to show me me cool music so i was actually a bit of a slow burn when it came to modern music i didn't really i remember there was like a family friend who was visiting from australia i think when i was like like 12 or 13 and he had one of those binders. You remember the CD binders? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. car? It was like 3,000 <laughs> CDs. Uh, for, for the audience watching, there's these things called uh, compact discs. <laughs> I don't know where the camera what, is. What year but... was that? Wherever the red light <laughs> is. The red light, yeah. Compact disc. It's this round device, and they, they used to store music on it. You a finite, it. There was a finite amount of music on this thing. Right. It didn't just play forever. But <laughs> If your songs weren't too long, you might be able to fit 20 tracks on right, there. Right, exactly, yeah. exactly. There was a limit to how many songs you could fit. Anyways, so <laughs> it, it, you, it used to be the, your, your coolness was measured by how big your binder was in your, in your car. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And like, you can only write on them once, by the way, generally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I should, yeah. <laughs> I should mention it. But yeah, the more CDs cds you had the more the more uh, the more bigger your jukebox was and and you use like like you know people would like trade like that was always the fun bit it's like you'd like trade trade albums you're like oh check this out oh you know because maybe your parents don't want you like buying the marilyn manson album well, you're <laughs> right about all this but you also you would find a lot about their personality the other person because oh, yeah. depending on some people have, i know exactly what you're talking about yeah some people would have like the little tiny numbers in the corner of each one and the little sticker on the little like thing, super ocd and it's like it's i will like, know if you did not no, return no, 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 one no, of my 500 where it goes <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like i'm sorry <laughs> you know exactly what mine, i mean Mine would have this, the, the CDs that weren't even in the sleeves. That you'd open it and be like, careful, they're going to fall. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's, it that's the definitely car. mine. That's mine. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but but he, he, he had like a bunch of, a bunch of bands and like, like modern stuff. And, and it was funny. Like, it was like I had a sense of what I was looking for. I was like, yeah, do you have anything loud? And I just didn't have like the, 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 the words to describe what I was looking for. Mm. I was like, do you have anything loud? And he's like, well, I have ACDC. Oh. I'm like, I'm like, okay, this is kind of cool, but it's not really what I mean. And he's like, well, they're the loudest band, band that ever. Yeah, on the planet, know? yeah. <laughs> I'm like, no. And then, and then he played like uh, The Offspring and Nirvana. And I was like, okay, now we're talking. <laughs> oh, now Offspring we're... was really. Yeah, that was around like, uh, I think uh, that was like, uh, what, was, what was it before Ixnay on the, the Hombre? Um, what was that album? I should remember this, but the one before that. There's a bunch of those, and then he showed me Nevermind by by Nirvana, which I was just That's like, the famous one with the baby in the pool yep. and everything. Yeah, and, that's the one which, that changed. Which I still think is like a musically genius. I will, I will, was it actually two discs, or was did they release two? Because remember, there was one that was blue and one that was orange, but they had the same image. I mean, as far as I know, it's one. It's a short one enough album. album that would... I don't know if there was like a special edition. Maybe it was that. I think whatever version I had was just one... Um, there might have the been the baby some. in the pool though the baby in the pool yeah. that one yeah uh and that album is um that's modern beatles man that's like uh wow see I, now every musician that i respect absolutely says the same thing when it comes to that album and it simply it it, it escaped me it, it just never i didn't get it and i love dave grohl now like i love all of his work oh since. so you never gone the album no and i was one of the <laughs> it's so bizarre but i was in the nbc newsroom at 30 rock when the ap wire came over that kurt cobain died oh wow. like i was there at the news when they were about to put it on the news wow so like it's a weird i'm even connected in weird ways like i had these plot points in my life that had and i met dave grohl at letterman and stuff uh uh I just, I don't know what it was about that album, but it didn't speak to me. But everybody I respect says that's the one. Well, there's something about that. uh, I mean, I can break down like as technical as you want what's going on. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but would you just illuminate me a little bit? Yeah, so what what they did, I could actually do it with a modern example, but I don't know if you know the band Ghost because I actually think they're doing the same thing. But like what's going on behind the scenes, what's going on is it's really actually adventurous and complex chord changes but but done it in a very palatable simple way but then it's reconciled by the fact that there are almost nursery rhyme level top lines 
that so again it's the music super easy to, for you super easy to sing along to like like two or three notes mm. like not that many that like reconcile these like actually pretty adventurous chord changes you won't hear like pick any nirvana song you won't hear any modern song using that chord progression i agree and maybe that's what used to irritate the hell out of me i don't know what it was yeah but like then you know, I, I, never, I never liked. It. I never liked I was the one Beatles. Of the, old, the kids in Back to the Future. <laughs> I, I, but, I, mean, I mean, you know, teacher, and like, <laughs> gr- it's grunge. It was kind of grating. I mean, I think part of the point was to be kind of grating. But like, yeah, but like Soundgarden was going on at the same time, and I yeah. didn't mind them. The Chris Cornell sound was it was equally as rough. Yeah, I'd I say it's a bit it more refined. I, well, I don't know. Oh, really? More refined? Yeah, yeah. Like okay. production wise and aesthetic, and like his voice is. His, you know what, what what Chris Cornell is almost like you got like a, a glam rock. Oh, I, they didn't, were, I didn't like them or anything. No, no, just... no, 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 no. But but like they were always like very technically proficient, right? We got these glam rock like technically well, maybe proficient that's singers. What I was, maybe that's what I was looking at. And Nirvana was like, it's not done yet. Nirv- <laughs> no, yeah, Nirvana's rough. <laughs> I was like, like, put it through the production studio. It, it, why don't it's you? It's rough around the edges, but it has a lot of charm. It was supposed to be like the 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 antithesis to this whole like overproduced kind of. Is you it know, possible also as simple as maybe I just liked happier music back then because it was really like yeah. Yeah. it was like really run on angry, You know, happy is a weird thing because I like music that sounds like happy to me sounds depressing to other people. Oh, fair I enough. I mean, I don't think you have to like it, but all I'm saying, like, for, for example, I never, I, I respect the hell out of the Beatles and I, it's not like I dislike them. I just never had like a Beatles phase, but when I listen to it, I respect them. Because I can identify actually the exact same thing happening with their music. Where again, mm. very interesting compositions, very adventurous uh, 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 chord progressions and, and note choices and things like that. And it's usually reconciled with a very simple and re- almost repetitive vocal line, which brings it home, which makes it easy to digest. You can sing along to it, but you're actually, if you were a musician, there's a lot to digest. There's a lot. Of, it works on a lot of no, layers. You're right, but for the audience, it's much more palatable because of the simplicity on the top when line. They're singing a lot, when they're singing along the top line, it sounds like a very simple thing, and you could potentially put a very simple chord progression behind it. And then what was sort of chosen is like wow that's that's where you went that's that's wild you so know? that's what it, i came up through jazz so maybe i may have a giant appreciation for this at the end of the day is it maybe just the simple fact that they were doing something new is yeah that all yeah was? yeah that was, it was very just groundbreaking stuff it was, i mean i don't know if they were like the first or whatever but they definitely popularized well, no, but that like eddie van halen with the shit he did i mean yeah it yeah, was yeah. That, like it was new absolutely absolutely Absolutely, yeah, and, and it was that. and it realize. was completely. It was supposed to be the opposite of like sort of like big rock and roll and like glam rock and all that stuff that was huge. Mm-hmm. Like there were no solos, and like yep. those guys had like soaring big Heavy voices. Lyric on Nirvana. He's like kind of mumbling throughout all of it, you know. Like, Heavy lyric, and I couldn't understand a word he was saying. Well, yeah. and it's all nonsense, like this complete nonsense. You know, there's not. They're not singing oh, about like no through lines. <laughs> yeah, like it's just it's so so like. It, it it was I think it was really just supposed to be like kind of a middle finger to that style of music. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree um, with that. And maybe that's why he didn't like it because like it, it was like oh this is literally just kind of giving a middle finger to a lot of the stuff that I appreciate. You know, could be. But the truth is, I liked jazz and stuff, and it really I never I never felt like Nirvana was attacking jazz in any way. No, they were specifically attacking like rock, like like big arena rock, yeah. which is the irony of it all. Because I think they always just wanted to be like a small like punk rock like fuck you band and became yeah. the biggest thing on the planet. Yeah. You know, and now they're bigger than Poison. Right. <laughs> So like they became the thing they hate. Yeah. No, but... Well, that's what happens, right? I hope not. Eventually, it's I don't want to become the thing I hate. No, no, you don't want to. But sometimes, but sometimes there are adjustments that need to be made because the cycle just brings you there. I think when you when you get that big that fast, I think that's that's a dangerous thing. I've always believed like the best the best successes happen gradually. Like. I don't want the get rich quick scheme. I don't want to get big overnight. I want slow and steady. I love that always you're with the this. companies, the band, with everything. Slow and steady is the key. And you see, you see these stories like people who win the lottery, like miserable. People who blow up overnight, miserable. We had this conversation yeah. yesterday. I can't. Oh no believe. way! Yeah, so we are definitely synchronized. Let's rehash it again for the no, audience. No, no, no. I don't. I don't mean about that. I mean you're so damn on point. I mean this is. I think feel. I feel like this is part of the great awakening. Everyone's sort of getting there right now. Yeah. Well, you know, we have a lot of history to draw from. I think it was like Bill Burr who was, I think he, he did a bit on, on Elvis. And he was like, <laughs> Elvis was the big, the, I'm, I'm just totally going to butcher it. But the point was what I thought was very poignant and very interesting. Was he was like, Elvis 
was like the first big rock star, like larger than life, bigger than Jesus, right? Yeah. And like no one had done that. So he then went on to make every single one of the cliche mistakes that we associate with that because he didn't have anyone to learn from. There was no one who'd gone to that point. Right. So he went down the drug path. He got all fat. He died on the toilet. You know, <laughs> yeah, like, all he, had, the he had all the things all, all in Elvis. one just so that like, at, and they all became the cliches, which, you know, some people did this or that or that, but he had them all because he didn't have anyone to draw from like, Hey, watch out for that. And they're going to steal all your money. <laughs> and like, you very know, fair. and it's like, and so we have a lot of history to draw from from we're, we're fortunate it's like okay like these are the things to watch out and look it may sound great to 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 blow up overnight and be an overnight success here's why it's terrible here's a you know one hit wonders that's a thing oh because yeah because you'll just disappear into into obscurity sometimes I, and, and you'll have that one song is that really what you want you know i agree with you fully and uh, one of the examples we use was like american idol like almost always the american idol is the flash in the pan and then the runner-up is the one who has the career generally interesting I, I didn't. Don't know I that, didn't. I don't I didn't know that know. that's always true because I'm thinking Kelly Clark. Well, you're on. You're on. You're on record people. now, so you know the <laughs> internet will judge. Where's the red light? <laughs> no, I'm just. I'm just kidding. But yeah, no. I mean, that's a very. That's a very fair point. You know, um, and and I think, I mean, I heard this statistic about. I I don't know how true this is, but but it's kind of one of these weird statistics that like lottery winners say like there's a surprising amount of them for like the the mega millions you know like when you really win the lottery like those are the people who are, who are the most miserable and oftentimes they say it's the worst thing that ever happened yeah they did everything wrong yeah and it like there's some weird stats like like you then have like you're then 300 percent more likely to be murdered and like yeah, yeah, it's yeah. just all these things that happen that you don't you never think lived on that frequency you have no idea when you when you can build to, to, to wealth and success and whatever, you're doing it gradually. Whatever problem you face will just be one step above what you can handle and you, you, you grow into it and you learn, you learn from it or you adapt to it or whatever. Yeah. But it's usually something that's relatively surmountable because you're relatively equipped, maybe slightly under-equipped and you can adapt to it. But when you fucking blow up overnight, it's like the, 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 the realm of things you deal with, this is why people lose their money because it's like, I don't, know what to do with this yeah you put it in the bank no you don't put that money in the bank right you know like like but what do you do oh well th th there's just there's all these different levels you skipped exactly. on the way to learning how to handle this kind of life and i think it could be overwhelming so actually i when i say i don't want to to get rich quick or anything like that, i genuinely mean it i think it, it could be a real curse you yeah. know i um, think uh, i put everything in tv terms because unlike you i was planted in front of the television for my whole young life um <laughs> so all of my references are tv but i think of my favorite shows over the years that would not have been famous had they been yanked right after their first three or four bad seasons cheers seinfeld ER. I mean, ER did yeah. pretty well, but um, but some of those other ones, like Cheers, was the last show of the week on the lineup for ratings. Oh, <laughs> it's really? Premiere week, yeah, the last. And Seinfeld did poorly for years. Really? Until must see TV. Years. Yeah, they moved it all around until it got behind Cheers or wherever they put it at nine o'clock. And then so it became back then, it was TV. all about finding that right slot. No, the, the show right. was always good, but it wasn't being. It didn't have the ratings. It wasn't the getting was the right people. Good. Yeah, the, the right people. It didn't have it. the audience. Yeah, it's such a different art form then because now everything's on demand. But back then you had to like pair it up with the people who would be yeah, likely to watch it at the right time. At you the know? right time. There's certain blocks. I remember seeing this like there was that, that there was like that block, which I didn't even realize because it's like in hindsight, it's like just such a power block. But I think it was like 30 Rock. Was it Community 30 Rock? Like Was Parks and Rec also on at that same time? But like. I don't even know. Was that NBC? <laughs> like, I, yeah. Those are all NBC. Yeah, yeah, like there was like this like block of four shows in like the prime time on the the prime day, and it's like wow, they're all four of those shows are like legendary, you know? That was it's it like, back in the day. It was it was Thursday nights, and it was the Cosby Show. I think did it first for NBC, but whatever really? it was, it, I know, I know. Can we even say that these days? <laughs> and there used to be a show. <laughs> he was a gynecologist. It's weird now. It's weird now. <laughs> it's all weird Wait, now. Was he really? Yeah, and his wife was an attorney. It's all weird now. <laughs> See, I didn't watch. It caused me. I watched it as a kid. I don't remember anything. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, his office was at the house too, like downstairs. You know what I mean? Oh, so boy. I remember he would always. I think so. Just so. aged very poorly. Uh, 
anyway, that was like a huge thing, and it became this thing. So whatever they paired with it became the Thursday night lineup. And then right. when, when Seinfeld was on, and you know, when uh, Cheers took over, and then ER, like it was just it was it was you could put anything in there, and it would. In fact, you had to be careful what you put in there because it was going to be a success. Period. Wow! And so every it was almost like ending. It made changes to their own lineup to accommodate that competition. Like Thursdays were a big deal for certain shows, so they would counter program to try to get that audience. Wow! Yeah, it's like it's crazy. Like pants. Thursdays, and that you could like you could like decide what show got big basically as long as it was like good enough for like stand on its own TV. You'd be like, all right. We'll give you a Thursday shot. And it's like, yeah. well, this is the best shot you'll ever get. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah, I mean, just like music business, I'm sure the upfronts and everything, they probably all parallel. It's probably the same kind of shit with releases and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. It's in, it's interesting. It's interesting because it's just... Um, what I mean, I mean that, is there are strategies behind it. There are a bit of, of course, of course, of course. There's always strategies. But like, I'm trying to think like... There's like any analog to like the Thursday night, mm. you know. Thing. Oh, and like and, well, and it's like there were in the old days when there were shows when you could put people through shows, shows right? Shows, shows. So, what remind me? What's a what's a show again? Uh, I know you didn't grow up with TV. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, I did. So I back did, in I, the day, you no, could, I was you allowed could, to watch like, like 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 PBS Edutainment. If it was if it had well, hang on, if they value. were on Sesame Street, they were already famous from being yeah. on one of those right, shows. Right, 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 right. <laughs> Uh, I guess what I mean is that, like, you could, ha- if you could be music that got made back then by being on, Carson was good for music, but like Letterman, for sure. Letterman made tons of bands in the 90s because um, they yeah. couldn't get on regular television. Right. But they would, he would put them on at 1230 because he was Mr. Rock and Roll guy. Oh. And that's how we got a lot of bands. I mean, I saw, it, well, I worked at Conan after Letterman was gone, but he did the same thing and carried on. So that I don't could know really, how many that bands. That could give you your, your break, huh? Oh, yeah. I, I, <laughs> fastball. Uh, what's the one I always mentioned? Sugar Ray. Uh, all of those bands from the 90s, I saw them make their network television debuts. I worked there. I pulled cable or or put their mics on them or whatever. Wow. Yeah, and that's it's weird. like So you could, like you could make it. That's like almost part of that path, that, that, like, that path to success. It's like, all right, did you hit that marker yet? Yeah. Did you, did you oh, did you do Late Night yet? No. Yeah, okay, or whatever well, show. Yeah, yeah, because it was like, it, however, if you sold 500,000 copies, great, but like 4 million people who wouldn't have bought those records just heard you now too. Oh, Or however yeah. many, whatever. So they probably just see like sales skyrocket after that. I think in the old days it might yeah. have been because that's where, like you pointed out, like Elvis, whatever, they had culled the audience back then. Nowadays, everybody's everywhere. Good and luck. The, you got to shake hands on the street to get people to watch your shit. Yeah, it's of crazy. Course, of course. And, and like, like if, if you're on at like 1230, then probably people will be a bit more open, a bit more punk, a bit more rock and roll. Yeah, like yeah. A, well, not, not everybody's not as buttoned watching. down, Not as buttoned down as like, you know. Shit. Yeah. That's what we were trying to, you know, that's why we got bubbles. <laughs> <laughs> Smoke machine here and everything. Yeah, there we go. Dave's, Dave's uh, desk came with bu- uh, with all these buttons, so we hooked them all up. Oh, uh, do you know what the buttons did? Well, one just made sm- smoke. <laughs> By being on the uh, and the smoke and lasers. There we go. That's a good enough button. Did the bubbles before we got the bubble. Look, I, I'm glad you're wearing a hat. These won't affect you. We got the bubbles here. We got for the, the bubbles. Wide. We got the. I mean, like this is this, this desk is overpowered. I love, I love it. Love everything. <laughs> With great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> that is, they obviously. I mean, did they have bubbles on the show? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. They had all, no, for so real. So he was just triggered. Like, like yeah, he had buttons up. back here to like just do stuff. To it was his. It was, it was Dave's place at originally. <laughs> See, I, I didn't. I didn't watch. Uh, any late late night till like later you know or maybe reruns of stuff like just because like was yeah, conan we, around when you were watching like when did i you... mean conan's probably the guy i'm most aware of and he's probably the guy i would connect with the most like humor wise and gotcha. i listened to his podcast religiously really i love i've his never podcast. heard it everybody says it's great it's hilarious i i used to know sona she's on it too right oh really yeah she's hilarious too oh, so so amazing. the thing is it's very free for, like I feel like what I, I I feel like it's a bit of a deep dive into who he is and like you know the thing I like about it like as an artist is he does open up a lot about like his struggles as an artist and you know not that I'm anywhere at his level in what I'm doing but like it's like there are a lot of parallels the, the stuff that he deals with and like you can tell like there's a lot of insecurities which which I have as well yeah. you know so it's kind of nice to see like artist insecurities yeah it's yeah. just the the normal imposter syndrome stuff that that, that but it's, it's interesting to see that even he has that and that that 
I mean, maybe it's not a relief that it, that, you know, never goes away. Because if it doesn't go away at his level, it never goes away. <laughs> yeah. But, like, it's it's interesting to see also that, like, that dude's done everything. I mean, he's he basically could disappear for uh, forever as of today and will still have had, like, the most storied, crazy career. Agreed. And he's still pushing it forward. Still, still producing, yeah. Yeah, still producing and still, like... He just got a new show. He's doing a new... He's ending the TBS show to take it over to HBO Max, doing a new show. There. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. That I'll watch. <laughs> so you know what I mean? Like more and more. Uh, I will say this about Conan to his credit. And she used to work with Andy for years. Um, he is, I worked with him when I was in high school. I didn't go to my senior year because I was an intern at 30 Rock working on those shows. Wow. He seems this, and I don't know him that well, but he seems the same today as he did fucking almost 30 years ago. Yeah. Well, I think that when you, like we were talking like about the podcasts. Same, they, we, he was struggling in the beginning, man. People don't really remember that about He Conan. opens up about that. So I don't know very much. I know about this just from what he's talked about on the show. When I was there, we were getting picked up by the week. Yeah, that's right. Normally, the show gets picked up like by the year or the multiple years. He's alluded to the fact that he was like, you know, it's like almost like a mistake, and someone's going to regret it, and it's just going to end terribly, and it's you know, at least it was a mistake, and someone was going to pay for it, and all of those things, except he turned it around. Right, right. And I, I think, I think he, he's one of the sharpest, quickest, funniest people. Like, because on on the show, he's he's just reacting to stuff. I'm like, Jesus Christ, this guy. His brain's nuts. It's just on a different level. Like, he's not, like, normal people don't work like that. And it's. I think he's wicked smart for all the things you're saying. But then you throw in, like, oh, he went to Harvard and he's around some of the smartest people, comedy writers in the world all the time for the last 30 years. But I think think he's saying how, like, there's, like, a lot of. um, you know, there's a lot of insecurity, and in you know, we, we have competitive. Us, us artists get competitive, so it's just well, interesting. You mentioned imposter syndrome too. Yes. And I'm sorry to cut you off, but that's something. I don't know an artist who doesn't struggle with it. If anybody doesn't know what imposter syndrome is, you're constantly worried about being found out that you're not as good as everyone thinks you are. Yeah, and which is which which I I like every second of every day. I'm, I mean, even look at where I'm at now. I feel much more deserving of the radio shack and working you know like work and working on music in my free time like that is sort of where i think i belong Don't so you all feel of like- this stuff all all the success and everything i have now is feels wrong and it's like one of these days someone's gonna be like oh, oh shit, it wasn't oh, we got him. it wrong yeah. that wasn't for you no. that was no you see all you see all your friends there who are way more talented than you that was for them. So you're gonna go back. Yeah, you're gonna be homeless now. That was that was what yeah, was supposed our mistake, to be. For. Sorry. Yeah, our bad. Hey, you had a few good years. Go back to the street where you belong. You know, like that's that's this like deep rooted fear, which uh, which I get to talk about with my therapist all the time. So <laughs> it's uh, it, it's true. It's the so struggle true. is real. Um, I mean, I, I guess on one hand, it, uh, it it does drive me and it pushes me to like you know keep my skills sharp and whatever. On the other hand, it is – it's always a bit of a relief to, to find out that, like, I'm not the only one going through – because it feels like I'm the only one going – because it feels like I'm the imposter, you know? And everyone else has got it all figured out. When you're all not here, we talk about this a lot. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we're going to laugh at you. <laughs> yeah. So, like – so there it, – it, it's, a, it's a thing that's, that's, that's uh, kind of frustrating, but then also – Pretty interesting to you know, like he does open up on that on 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 his podcast, and as I've met, I, you met probably a ton of artists, and you know, it's just something. I, I think it just comes with the territory at at certain point because maybe maybe we're very blessed to do what we do, and like it just feels like like this shouldn't be happening. You know? Why it's wouldn't like, it go away any second? Yeah, time, it's yeah. like I thought I was supposed to be working some desk job somewhere. You know, like yeah. that was supposed to be. That's what I was told my whole life was going to be my life. Your dream job <laughs> went out of business. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's yeah so it's like at, at the end of the day it's like okay yeah like so any day now this is gonna end so just better prepare for that you know oh my god um yeah so so um i mean you you think you think that he's pretty much like what you see is what you get right uh yeah um he is what you see what you i remember i was giving my mom a tour once and it was after hours it was late and uh, I can't remember why the hell we were there late and after hours and why I was with my mom at 30 Rock, but it all happened. I feel like that's a very interesting story that needs to be explored. But I'm literally walking <laughs> her through the studio and um, I could hear him singing in his dressing room. And I was like, go in his dressing room. Be quiet. Like, it was like nine o'clock at night or something. Like, I don't know why he was even still there, but he was. 
And he's in his dressing room. This is in the hallway outside. You don't know the show. In the hallway outside of 6A, the old famous Letterman hallway. And and sure enough, he's in there, and his door is open, and he doesn't have a shirt on, and he's in the mirror combing his hair singing because he sings all the time. He's either singing or playing the guitar all the time. Oh, wow. And he was. And I'm like, just come here. I'm trying to get my mother. I know she's going to – I'm I'm afraid she's going to make a scene because she's kind of – she was always that type. And, uh, and, and she didn't. And I just said, hi, Conan. And he goes, hey. And my mother goes, Hello. <laughs> of course we get around the corner she's like he's very handsome in person handsome. Um, but he just like if we stayed if, if it were anybody else he would have given us 15 minutes of his time he would have given us a studio tour he would have spent that time with us I needed to get my mother the fuck out of there yeah. but he, what, he, he yeah he's a, he's a normal dude who yeah. is wicked smart who is just trying to like I think he's trying to fit in this world, and he got that thing that, that you got. Like, here's this dream job. He's going to replace David Letterman when David Letterman was huge, like the biggest thing going. And he, Conan was – nobody had ever heard of him. Yeah. If you were a comedy writer, you knew who he was from The Simpsons or Saturday Night Live, but that was it. They were just like – I mean, like, how did how – did, I don't know the history. And maybe, like, everyone who's Lorne watching – Michaels it, picked him. Right, it was just yeah, like, Lorne yeah. Mi- when Letterman left, they couldn't figure out what to do with the show. They offered – I think they were talking about a bunch of people, but uh, um, NBC wasn't sure so what Lorne's to do. So Lorne's got an eye for talent like no one else because to be able to see that, you know? I don't agree with you. Really? I mean, I definitely agree with you with Lorne and his eye for talent. I don't think he nailed it with Conan. I oh. think Conan rose to the occasion. Oh, Wow. I don't think Conan did do a good show the first few years. I think he wanted to. Yeah. He definitely wanted to. But Conan, uh, once Andy left, when Andy left the show in the first couple years, after the first couple years, and Conan was then left there alone without somebody, <laughs> without all that. And he had Max across the way, but it was really Conan learned how to talk to the camera, which meant Conan knew how to talk to his audience. Mm. And that is, for me, when it changed and Conan changed. Not him as a guy, but the Conan persona. persona. And that's when the show became good. And that's when the show took off. So, so that's just me being the guy who should be a talk show producer, but isn't. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> right? That's a, see, that's a really interesting that insight, shit. though. That's some interesting insight. And once again, shows your eyes to the occasion. You don't, you don't become an overnight success. Even with, I was going to use him as an example before, but I never thought it would come back up again. Right. Well, I was totally going to use him. But, but, but as, as you're saying, like, it's like that, that's a slot that could potentially like, make you an overnight success, and it and it didn't the could pressure could have pulled the plug too yeah yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's really it's really it could have gone either way yep and he rose to the occasion so yeah I mean like that's uh, I, I definitely didn't have a test like that <laughs> that sounds horrendous well how, can we <laughs> how the hell did periphery become as big as it is obviously hard work you're definitely not lazy no everyone what works hard everyone you. works hard this is the secret is like like people are like oh you just gotta like work hard and want it and it's like no that gets you your lottery ticket <laughs> you know and then it's just a lottery ticket that's all it is um, uh, people really hate this answer, but it is really true. So much of it is luck. I know that you understand that from seeing how manifestation lo- and luck. Yeah, I mean, like, I'm not gonna say it's only luck, but it is such a big part of it that can't be ignored, and it's treated as if it's not a factor. That's a good point. When people That's talk about why, you, like, even when I say like I'm gonna go up against the odds, it's like I understand that like it's gonna require luck because yeah, like they're. So many talented people I know who don't, whether you want to say like they don't have the right set of skills or maybe not business minded enough to like take advantage of it, you don't really choose to be good at that stuff. You know, that's just kind of how you're built or whatever. Yeah. So you got lucky. But for whatever reason, like, you know, I, it, our, our band had opportunities. We got lucky. And then we also had a good group of people uh, to where we were able to not squander those lucky opportunities, which is the other half. Because you could get lucky with an opportunity and completely squander it and nothing happens. Keeping you know? everyone moving. Getting everyone to move in the same direction is tough anyway, but yeah. keeping everyone moving in the same direction it's is re- damn near it's impossible. Re- it's really hard to start a band. <laughs> I started the band. <laughs> and finding members was very tough. I was playing a style of music. Wait, that, so is this how it started? You started perfectly? I started the band in like 2005. Wow. Um, and I just, as I said, I wanted to just do, do a van tour, you know, <laughs> I wanted to get it. I just wanted to, I was writing I f- everything. And I, I thought I was, there'd be some crazy steps between that and so I did it. <laughs> well, well, no, 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 no. But here's the thing: when you have a computer, you're like, "Well, I started a band." You know, I was yeah. making music. This, so this oh, is because in- you can do all the parts. Yeah, so you're th- making music. This is the in- this is the oh interesting God, thing. Mo- <laughs> most bands before that time, mo- most bands, if you wanted to write, you got to find musicians, get into a room, you jam, right? Yeah, and find it. I was composing, so I was writing all the parts out. Uh, and that's what I was saying. I wasn't a good enough drum. I was playing drums, but I was like, I'm not good enough to perform the stuff I want to. I want to write. I need to find a drummer who's better than me. 
And I found a lot of drummers who are better than me, but it's a very technical and weird style of music. Now it's kind of ubiquitous, but like it requires quite a, a technical minded approach. Um, and it was very weird. Uh, just kind of in layman's terms, like it's oftentimes four, four, mm -hmm. but it doesn't sound like it. It okay. sounds like anything, but, and it sounds you stay on the offbeat or what? It's uh, like constant syncopation Oh, I, I'm, or I'm like, or poly this. polymeters. Like, so like, it sounds like you're playing in seven or 13 or something like that, but it's really over four. And mm -hmm. there's like a remainder bar. So it neatly goes back to yeah, four. And you pop it back. Exactly. Yeah. See, this uh, is very interesting to me. Musicians must love your music. Yes. Yes. We're completely a musician's band. Like, like, and, and that's why it's tough to, that's why we're not that big a band, you know, but <laughs> we're interesting. Like, that's why you always say that. You're like, uh, you've never heard my band. Yeah. And I was like, no, why like, do you say that? Why is that your first if you're a thing? If you're a, musician, <laughs> if you're a musician and you're like a nerdy musician, then I'd say, okay, maybe there's a chance you've heard us. But like, even if you're a musician, if you're like, yeah, I play like rock or like alternative or like, you know, indie, it's like, you've probably nope. never heard my band, you know? <laughs> Um, and it's not like saying like our music's like like better or whatever or whatever. Like I don't even listen. Oh, to I didn't mean it like music. that either. But like, but 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 it's uh, it's just it's the stuff I enjoyed writing, you know. And it was it was kind of technical to play. It was hard to find members who could wrap their head. I remember like so so uh, one of the oldest actually now the the the, the oldest member or the band the the member who's been in the band the longest other than me, Jake. Um, was a worse guitarist than the other guy who was in the band at the time, like who was a shredder and he was incredible. But that guy couldn't wrap his head around what I was trying to do, mm -hmm. and Jake could, mm -hmm. you know. And Jake under and it's like one of those things where like pure technique and talent did not actually matter. There's like some drummers that were incredible, like jazz kind of fusion drummers, and they just really struggled like with understanding what I was trying to do. Um, again, nowadays a dime a dozen. If we lost all our members, <laughs> like like be easy to find replacements or whatever. But back then it was impossible, and I kept just auditioning. And like when I found like Jake, I was like, oh my god, like you understand, like holy You're shit. You're in my brain. Yes, like you get it. And I asked him to join, and he said no. <laughs> ha, like, yeah, <laughs> what a guy. Yeah, like it took it took a, it took some convincing to Thanks get him to join. Thanks a lot, jerk. <laughs> jerk that's his name no. but like uh yeah it took it so so there's that side and then the other fun side is personalities and gelling you know yeah. went through four singers before we found our singer like went through a few drummers like um and eventually we got a pretty stable light lineup um and then the other thing which i'm i'm pretty happy about is like we actually had i, I posted on forums i used to post you remember forums yeah, yeah. <laughs> i used to spend a shit ton of time yeah on so there's a lot of, like the thing is like the, the kind of music I was into, like metal and like um, the kind of stuff I was playing was not cool. And as I said, like not many people listen to this kind of stuff or whatever. <laughs> so very much like a car meet. You know how like when you go to a car meet, you just talk cars because you're like, oh, another human being it's I can talk to about cars and not annoy. <laughs> yeah, and you know? it's all in your face. So here and, we go. And like and like if you talk to your friends, they're like, dude, just shut up about cars. <laughs> like I don't care, you know? I see your point. Yeah. Right. It was like that with metal. So like – all of a sudden you have these forums where like everyone's stoked to be talking about these bands that you love, but no one in your real, you're, you're always like the metal guy in your group of friends. Right. No one cares. Right. They're all just like, dude, shut up. Like, yeah, yeah, I get it. It's loud. That's wonderful. Let's do something fun. You know? So like <laughs> it was a, a really cool way to like, just uh, bond with people like the same stuff. But I was posting my ideas up on these forums and I almost didn't want to do that because I was so self-conscious because I thought all my stuff sucked. Oh. There's a very there's a very big distinction here to be made, which is I don't think I'm a very good musician, yeah. but I love making music. Yeah. I don't and I don't have to be good at something to enjoy it. I don't think I'm that good at driving, but I love it too. You know, so like it's a it's a it's the same thing. It's like I I it's I possible think, you're very realistic. I'm just and very you don't realistic. want to overstep your. It seems like I'm just you're very, a very respectful person in general. I yeah, mean, well, I've seen real talent. I've seen real talent, so I know where I am. I'm, I don't think I suck, but I also don't think I'm good or anything like that. I think I'm okay. But I is it I'm, perhaps that you just have you have seen the scale? So yeah. You have a respect for it oh absolutely i'm with you then read the room absolutely. people don't have that skill anymore <laughs> i mean I, it's just it's not a skill it's just how it's just what i believe and i'm a very stubborn person so right you know yeah so you're I not going to convince me otherwise i love it um but uh but i i know my place basically right like i don't think i'm a particularly great guitarist i don't particularly like the way i sound but i love writing i really really enjoy that mm. and so i almost didn't share my stuff because i was listening to other stuff people were posting I'm like that's way better than mine but i was like whatever i'll just post it and, and if it sucks then i'll just never post another song again right uh but people are pretty they reacted well generally and then like you know 
Some people didn't, but like generally people seem to like it or enough people seem to like it to where I just keep posting. And I was very prolific because I was just like, this is a new thing. I can write by myself. So I just kept just uploading, uploading, uploading little ideas, whatever. And then before you know it, like there was a little bit of buzz around, you know, Bulb was what it was called at the time. Like that was, that became my, my sort of like pseudonym and like side Are we talking project. about a couple months, a couple of years? Yeah, this was over a couple of years. That's yeah. what I figured. Okay. And then so like. This is, a, this is really a proper grassroots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like what happened was like labels started to, to be like, okay, so there's a lot of buzz about this. Mm -hmm. But like, what is it? Is it a band or whatever? I'm like, Can well, we even get this guy? Yeah, it's like. You know, so he's never. Have you ever played a show? No. Um, if you go, have you ever on tour? No. So if you go on tour, how do we know your band's not going to break up? I don't know. You know. So like, you're not bankable, but everybody loves you. Yeah. So there's a, a weird thing where there was some hype. So we were getting record uh, record deals uh, and offers, but they were all terrible. And I knew exactly what I wanted. Here's the the thing that's a little different. At this. I mean, if you consider what a label really is, it's just a bank. Because if you try to make a record, and back in the day, like let's say we were going to put a record together, it would cost you like a quarter of a million, five hundred thousand dollars. What bank's going to give me that loan? No, you, nobody. No argument. But all here, of a I sudden, I'm recording on my computer. I could do this shit for free. I'm paying for artwork, and like what what they would do is they'd be like, okay, we're going to lend you a quarter of a million dollars to put this out. And you're going to give us your masters as collateral. We're going to own your music, and you'll collect a percentage. You know, like like anywhere from 11 to 19 percent because we just gave you this interest-free loan yeah you know which if it fails you don't have to pay back yeah you're welcome not a, not a terrible deal right <laughs> no but what happened at this point was like cds were starting to not sell and like the the, the model was starting to fail so they were like they're starting to do these things called 360 deals which were so predatory yeah we know where all they were about like that. yeah so for those who don't know there's another thing called in perpetuity they all go together <laughs> yeah 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 oh oh i always talk about this in the contract i was like this is lawyers in a nutshell because the contract was in perpetuity in the universe oh, because, yeah. because the <gasps> not solar even on system's this not enough you no, know <laughs> it's true it's because true. hey if they if they uh colonize alpha centauri we need to have the rights so 100 like <laughs> so i i was just like man this this lawyer speaks hilarious and there was another <laughs> phrase which was which was very sort of uh cryptic which i believe was like uh like needs to be commercially viable. So there was technically viable and commercially viable. Technically viable means eight songs, 35 minutes or whatever. So you can't just turn in like, oh, it's like 10 songs, but it's like three minutes long. 100%. There's our album. Right. You know? <laughs> you met so, the deliverables requirements, yeah. basically. But, but commercially viable was completely just, it basically allows them to shelve your album for no reason. You know, and that's because a really they say, oh, thing. it's not commercially viable that's, right that's now. That's a creative control clause. Yeah, that's where they get to say, well, we're going to need an extra chorus here or there, or we'll shelve your album, and you don't want that. So I started to talk to a lot of friends, and and you know, a lot of friends who had made mistakes with their their labels. It's like what to do, what to look out for, or whatever. So by the time we were starting to get these record deals, I was like, these are all bullshit, and I'm not fucking signing these. Mm -hmm. Um, and it sucked. I knew what I wanted. I knew I wanted a licensing deal because I was like, there's no way that you guys are taking our album that we do everything for. We're delivering you a finished album with artwork and everything. You're going to put it on the shelves and you're going to own our masters. <laughs> not fair. Like, are you insane? No, no. And they're like, well, you know, that's great. I understand your point, but no label is going to give you that deal. And I was like, all right, then we won't sign. Have a nice day. So we didn't sign for three years and we were watching all of our peers and our friends getting signed. And it sucked. That was some of the hardest times because it was like, man, like we're going nowhere fast. And it was like kind of a waiting game, but I was like, no, like the, you know, I'd like written that first album. I basically did all the work and I was like, I, there's no way that you're going to tell me like, you can rent this album from me. You can license it for me, but it will go back not to me, but to the band, you sure. know, it'll go back to the band because it, you, you guys have not put any risk. This is just not fair any other way. And eventually, uh, an LA label, Sumerian records, um, who who had sent us a deal from the beginning and was probably the most progressive in terms of the deals that they were offering? They're like, okay, we'll, we'll we'll give you what you want. Did you say Sumerian records? Yeah, Sumerian records. Like the Sumerians and the Mesopotamians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like and Ghostbusters. They, and everything they were and they, they were it's they, amazing. <laughs> they were they were a, a kind of a startup. They, they ended up becoming a very successful label. But at the time, every other label was like was like who? And there was Roadrunner Records who was trying to sign us. I remember but, hearing about them. But Roadrunner... They're Road not Road, around anymore either, are they? No, they got bought out by Warner. So like oh, it's yeah, now sure. Warner Music. But like Roadrunner was like kind of like one of the big labels to be on. And they had the cachet. Gotcha. Their deal was terrible. And and they were like, no one's going to give you that deal. And then the second that we signed the deal with Sumerian, they're like, okay, where can we get you? Because I was like, look, Sumerian, you're great. 
you're only great in the states. We're only signing. We're not doing in perpetuity in the universe. We're doing a licensing deal in <laughs> North America. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we kind of narrowed that down a tad. <laughs> but uh, then we then we did different deals with different territories because I was like, okay, um, you know, Roadrunner, you're you're actually good overseas. We will do whatever. We have a label for Canada and one for Japan. Um, and that's how that all sort of came together. Awesome. It was patience and it was kind of knowing what we wanted. Like, like we knew exactly what we wanted of our, out of our record deal and we would not accept anything less than that's what amazing. We and you waited for it. Absolutely. I think that's amazing. And now, now we own our entire catalog again. I think this so, is a testament. I think this is a testament to you. And, and this is all exactly how it was supposed to work out. Do you, when you look backwards on it now, do you see like the little the little stepping stones of like how it all kind of came together. Yeah. But it also makes me be like, don't ever start a band because <laughs> there's so much luck. So many little, yeah, like no, I but said, there's nothing wrong with that. There was no big it. break. It there was no big break at any point. Every, anything that even seemed like a li- li- uh, big break was just another little step. And oh, as you said, every it's time. all yeah, just yeah, yeah. little stepping stones. And I'm like, it took so many stepping stones, just kind of pointing all in the right direction. Like that's luck. Like that. I could never recreate. If I had to start a band from scratch, I wouldn't. You know, yeah. I would just do something else because I, I understand how much of it was just good fortune uh, and being in the right place at the right time. Like being at a point where like I could get my music out there on forums. People are like, what's the secret? I'm like, whatever I'm going to tell you is irrelevant right <laughs> yeah. now. Like it does not work. They're like, should I, should, you know, should I focus more on social media promotion? I'm like, yeah, everyone does that. That's not going to make you unique anymore. That is right. just a baseline requirement. That's part of it now. Yeah. Now you need to find out what's the thing that other bands are not doing. And when I was doing it, I wasn't doing it strategically. I was just like, oh, I'm talking to a bunch of nerds about nerdy stuff. Might as well post my music, you know? Yeah. In the same way that like, oh, yeah, like, oh, we're at a car meet. You want to drive my car, make a YouTube video about it or whatever. It's not because you're like, oh, we're going to take over the world with our channel. It's like, no, it's just <laughs> some fun with my friends, you know? Yeah. Like the 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 impetus for all this stuff was very just sort of genuine and uh, and and really just about being a nerd, <laughs> you know. And I say again, that's why I feel like it worked. Man, I, I really do. Staying true to yourself and just what whatever that that thing is when you're watering the right plant inside you, whatever that thing is that what's the Tomorrowland feed the right wolf or whatever. Feed the right wolf. Uh, fear doesn't seem like it's a big thing for you. Did you have to like conquer fear at some point in your life or anything like that? Well, the fear it was like going to school. Like it was like relief. Like once you got ha- out of that shit, and then maybe a little bit when you were posting your songs, but you did it, so it wasn't. Yeah, a problem. like yeah, it never felt like work. It felt like what I was supposed to be doing. I feel like that's how you are for everything. I feel like yeah. you look at it, you have it up in your head, and then you okay, well, I got to do this. But that, that's how that, I know if I want to do if I want to do something, you know, or if I'm. I have a lot of ventures, a lot of business ventures, and it's like I only really do the things that I would do for free anyways, you know? Amen. Like um, I don't really produce albums anymore. Um, I, I, I kind of fell into producing albums for a while because it was a good way to make money, not have to work. I ended up working at a container store. Nice. I was like I could take a month <laughs> off. I could take a month off and like produce an album. Okay, I'll do that. And now I only produce albums where I'm like, you know, I'll, I'll get paid for it because I need to get paid. For it. Like, but I'm like, I, I'll only produce albums that I would have done for free. Like, oh, wow. I, like I would because you're already inspired on that music. Because I've done ones just for money, and those have always sucked. Yeah. Like, and those are those are the wrong reasons. So like now, and and I don't produce. Like I officially don't. I did my buddy's uh, band who I did their first and third album. And we have very good writing chemistry, and I knew it would be a really good time, and they paid me well. But like, it's the kind of thing; it's the kind of project I would have done for free, you sure. know. Uh, and that was a lot of fun. That's awesome. So that's like breaking my no production rule, and it was a good call to do it, you know. But that's kind of like my philosophy now: is like the jobs I do, the, the my businesses, and all that. Like they all start out as passion projects. They're all things that we never thought would actually be successful, but we're like, this would be really fun. And even if it's a failure, we'll get this product or this cool thing out of it, or this cool experience out of it. And even now it's like any, any of the work that I do for these things, I'm like, that's a lot of fun. Like I've got to write a song for an ad that we're going to, that we're going to do, you know, like that's, that's a good time. That's not really work. So, Sounds awesome, man. Yeah. It, it, I, I think, I think that you just have it. I think that you have it. I think whatever it is, you've got it. And I think it doesn't it's feel like it. 
I know. It feels that's like good. I'm gonna lose. It feels like I'm, I'm gonna you. lose it tomorrow. That's why I'm telling you. You need to hear it from somebody. Yeah, but I'm stubborn and I don't believe you. Fine. So you don't have to. <laughs> I but hear but my I mom's voice. My mom's voice is like, "Don't forget, you can lose everything. You, you know, you could you, you could lose everything tomorrow." <laughs> you, you need one on each shoulder. But yeah. right now, I'm telling you, you you're could, awesome. You could be, and I think you could be the angel. <laughs> you could be the angel on the shoulder. Um, we have totally gone for. I mean, we. Well over an hour, okay, and yeah. uh, we didn't even get to cars and stuff. But would you come back sometime and let's yeah, just like let's just talk cars because this was me talk. nerding out about the music stuff. Yeah, I didn't yeah, yeah. mean to go as long about it, but I really wanted to learn. Some no, things. I'm, I'm sorry if I if I talk too much and I can talk way too much about cars. <laughs> no, yeah, well that's what I'm saying. Come back for the cars. <laughs> we'll come back. For I the found cars. this really really interesting, and I want to like come to your studio sometime or something. Yeah, absolutely. Come. I mean, like like. Uh, you or can, is the studio back east? The, the studio's in Texas. Oh, but okay. If, if you're ever uh, in Texas, <laughs> well, when I'm driving across the country. If you're, ever, if you're ever in Austin, you know, come by, come by, and I'll show you the studio. Please um, keep coming to Breakfast Club whenever you're in town. We yeah. love seeing you. Thank you for making time for so this. So Breakfast Club is the best meat, and I'll and I'll tell you why. Because I don't like car meats. Because I like to drive. <laughs> I have one of the, I I you know I have I have nice cars, but like, it's one of those weird things where people like I was really worried about like people knowing what kind of cars I had because it's like they say the wrong things about me because. Mm. I have them because they're wonderful cars to drive, especially if you have a nice road like, like Angeles Crest or something to drive yeah. on, uh, or a nice track. Um, and most of the car meets, I mean, fair play to them, but it's more about showing off and whatever. It's like I don't really care about that stuff. And sometimes there's a lot of people, it's a lot. Mm -hmm. So this is like the best thing because you have to do one of the best drives in the world to get to this kind of secret meet where it's all drivers. Everyone drives it. Your car's dirty. <laughs> that's that, that's a thing. That's a thing. I'm always the guy going to a car show with a dirty car, you know, which is like blasphemy to some people. And I'm just like, I don't care. Like like we said, it's just gonna get dirty tomorrow because yeah, you're gonna drive I'm gonna it. Keep driving you're it. You're gonna right, keep right. driving it. You're not gonna be like, well, you know, maybe we'll take the other one because like I just watched. It's like that never enters my head. So so I like to go to the meets that are more those kinds of people because we get along way better. Um, and the very fact that you have to go on this sort of like very. Uh, uh, fun and stimulating drive just to get to it. You know, it's not a place you can get to by accident. Let's say, right, right, right. Um, <laughs> not a lot of through traffic. No, <laughs> not really. <laughs> like I say, that road is literally just enthusiasts and commuters. Like that's it. Yeah, that's it. Uh, and um, uh, you know, it's. A, it, I think I actually found the meat by accident because I just went. Like on a, oh, on I a, thought you came with Matt one time. I didn't realize. No, 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 no. I just think I or came Lieberman. up. Or Lieberman. I don't know why I thought you came with one of those guys. I, I did. I did come later, but like the first time, That's I was. Awesome. I, I just. I just went early uh, on a, a weekday, and I'm a musician, so I never know what day of the week it is. I just <laughs> don't right. like to go on the weekends because that's when all the traffic. Too crazy. Yeah. But I'm like, okay, that's yeah, early on a weekday, so let's go up. There was no traffic. It was a beautiful drive. And I get there, I'm like, whoa, there's a lot of Porsches there today. <laughs> like something's going on. They're like. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of like this unofficial uh, Porsche meet, and then like it, it was like everyone knows it's about it. It's incredibly unofficial, like still to this day. But it's everyone, everyone, unofficial. everyone in everyone who's my friends in the scene and who likes to drive knows about this. And and I, as I was telling uh, Nicole earlier, it's like. I've met a lot of people who live here and who are car enthusiasts who don't even know about that road. And oh, it's I, like, know, I know. It's like that I don't want to tell those people. <laughs> I mean, that road is like the best. Maybe, yeah, maybe I shouldn't say this. Yeah, it's the best kept secret yeah. of, the, of, this, uh, of this area. It's a very special road. You guys are very lucky to have it. So, so like, please, yeah. whenever you're in town, keep coming by. We'd love Absolutely. to see you. Um, and I just, I, I think you're great. I really do. I think you're great. You're a new friend, but I think you're great. Yeah, thanks. I, I think the same about you guys. The very fact that you built this this is weird. Shows that we have this, very... This is weird, but we definitely have some simpatico going on. Yeah, like this is like if I was into your 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 stuff, like this is the kind of stuff I would do. I <laughs> like, used to do this with music. Right. Ex I, I that's exactly same, what I'm saying. Thing, yeah. So I, I, I see this set and I'm like, oh, well, I, I, I see you. I see you. <laughs> Once it was like, we're not at the dining room table, we got the desk. I was like, all right, well, we're going to need a microphone sponsorship. So we got Telefunken involved. You good, know what I mean? It was good like one, microphone of those, company one of those too. things. That's a legendary microphone company. Incredibly right? so. Uh, yeah. And we'll talk about it another time. But I mean, they used to do the radios for Porsche and they're in tele uh, Connecticut where I grew up. So no way. Like all of this stuff, it kind of was all of the I always right thought stuff. they were German. They were, but oh. a Jew from Connecticut bought the company so that he, and this is for real, his name is Tony Fishman. Shout out to Tony Fishman, uh, the owner of Telefunken. He literally bought the company so that he could 
change what this name is known for. He wants to only broadcast good vibes. And I swear to God, that's not, it's not a tie-in or anything. That's his own mission statement. But Telefunken, the brand, is a Jew from Connecticut broadcasting wow. good vibes with the old German Hitler brand. <laughs> <laughs> he wanted to bring it back and give it a good, uh, a, a yeah, good thing. I mean, they make some of the best uh, mics, some of the best condenser mics that you have in the studio. The legendary and stuff. The classic so. stuff is amazing. Yeah. 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 So, like, uh, anyways. I think you're amazing. Please come back. Let's talk cars. Absolutely. Next time you're in town, just whatever, and we'll do one of these again. And um, I love you. Uh, I love you. T- it, I love you both. It's a date. <laughs> this isn't a real show, so I'm just going to stop it now. <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Misha, for spending time with us. We had a blast. You are welcome here anytime. Please come back soon. Uh, in the meantime, I'd like to remind everyone else that Misha got a $50 gift certificate from Cruise into Wellness CBD. The Cruise is with a Z. <laughs> Cruise into Thanks, everybody. Yeah.